This is the Australian Hunting and Beyond podcast with Matt. The hunting journey continues. Let's get into it. A bit of a different start to the episode tonight. Before we get into the actual episode, we thought, well, I do like promoting hunting and a really good cause. And it's coming up on September 1st to 3rd. So tonight we've got Max from In the Dark. Yeah, and how you going, mate? Mate, tell us about this Fox Tax. Fox. <laughs> Let me do that one again. <laughs> tell us about the Fox Tastic weekend that you guys are running. Hey, excellent. You sound like me trying to say it. I, I regretted calling that instantly every time I try and say Fox Tastic. I'm like, finally getting the hang of it now. Um, so the Fox Fox Tastic Weekend is a national fox hunting competition that you can basically run from your own fox hunting properties. You go out, you shoot your foxes, you keep a tally, you let us know, and we've got a bunch of random prizes. We've got a first, second, and third prize, which is 150 for first. Uh, I think it's $100 for second and 50 for third. So, yeah, it should be a really good event. Um, hopefully, we can get lots of people entered and get lots of people out shooting foxes. I, I love it because it's always good to knock off a few pests and, and help out. So, it's obviously national, so it's across Australia. And I know you jumped on. Uh, so, guys, if you haven't, jump over to Hunting Connections podcast and listen to Zach. And his latest episode is in regards to this and, and a bit more. But we just wanted to talk about the actual event. So it's a national event and it's a team event with two to five members. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. So basically we went with a, a team event to stop cheating. We're running a, a shake test basically. So you've got every time you kill a fox, you've got to do a quick recording with you, your team member, team members. You'll get a number on the, the night, on the starting night that you quote in this video. And basically, yeah, you just shake the fox and trim an ear off of it so you can't use it again. Um, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, it does. It makes I, I think it's a good idea because, yeah, once it's once you dock an ear, it's, uh, you're not going to be able to put it back on to, to uh, boost your numbers. Yeah, and exactly. Giving it a shake, you know, it's uh, nice and fresh. So no, I think it's great. So it's over Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Is there cutoff times? Uh, so the start time on Friday is at 6 p.m. Um, we aim to have a, a group email or a, a WhatsApp group where all the numbers will be released for the teams. From there... If you can only hunt one night, you only hunt one night. Um, we've got a tiebreaker system. So the first person, say two teams, shoot 10 foxes each. The first team to submit their tally is the winner. So if you go out on a Friday night and shoot 10 and someone goes out on the Saturday night and shoots 10, but you submit it on the Friday night, they submit on the Saturday, that person who submits on the Friday is the winner. Um, but we've also got some really great random prizes um, so we've got a couple of steel targets from from two different companies, uh, one being STS targets. The others is the Bunnies of Bill Yang. Um, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Eureka Outdoors are donating some T-shirts. Uh, In the Dark is donating some of our apparel. Um, and we've got some stickers, I think, coming from Firearms Owners United. Cool. Well, guys, if you haven't, go check out the Facebook or the Instagram, I'll get you to let them know where that is now, mate. Yep. So on Facebook, you can find us at In The Dark and on Instagram, it's In The Dark underscore or In underscore The underscore Dark 369. Mate, sounds good. I love what you're doing. I love the event. I love it's national. So if you've got access to property, if you can get out and about and try and knock some foxes, jump in on this and let's do our bit to control some pests. Like it. Share it. Let's get it out there. I hope this uh, does a little bit to help out, mate, and all the best with it. Really appreciate that, mate. Thanks for having us on. All right, guys, let's get into the episode. Welcome back, guys. Different one tonight. I, um, I've never done this before. I've never taken anyone out. And it had been conversations I'd had with a few people going, why haven't I? And I, I sort of look at it and go, I'm, I'm by far from an expert. So I always was very hesitant of saying, well, why would I take someone out? I haven't even got a deer yet. So why would I be the person to take out another hunter? And after a few conversations with people, I went, well, maybe I'm looking at this the wrong way. 
and maybe I should because that's giving back. It's, you know, I do have some things to offer and I've been very privileged in getting to talk to a lot of people that have such like amazing knowledge. So I thought, hell, why not? So in the Australian Hunters Club, there was a new thing set up where people could put up a profile and you could sort of connect with people in the local area. So I was happy enough to put my hand up and say, hey, if anyone wants to. And I got a message from Grant and Grant's joining us tonight because I started chatting with him and went, hey, this bloke's a good guy. Let's uh, let's go out for a hunt. Let's go, go have a, a look. And so I took Grant out to a state forest. Um, we went out to Belanglo State Forest because we're both here in Sydney and he hasn't got his R license, but it was more just a bit of a, a recon for me because it's the first time in the forest. So I just wanted to take him out and say, hey, this is how... I've done things, this is the safety side of things, and we're going to just unpack what happened tonight. And And I really want to hear from his perspective because I've got my perspective on what happened, but I really want to hear from him. So, Grant, mate, really appreciate your time tonight. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Matt. Firstly, why the hell would you want someone like me taking you out? I think that's the big question. <laughs> well, to be fair, I didn't know who you were before you went out. So if I could go back in time, maybe I'd change it, but no. Probably get a better hunter. <laughs> yeah. No, mate. Um, you know, when Chris set up that directory on the Hunters Club, um, whenever I get his emails, I know he's got something good to say. So I really wanted to help him out. He said he wanted to test things and see how they were going. And yeah, you were like the first guy that I saw pop up. You looked like a friendly enough dude. And um, yeah, I just thought I'd reach out, test out the system and then, who knows, maybe make a connection and learn a bit. So you say you're not the best hunter, but you know, mate, I learned a lot. I learned heaps when we were out there. Well, that's good to hear because I actually had a really good time and it was one thing, it's actually made me change my mind a lot in being hesitant to take new hunters out. And you got a pretty unique story because we started to have a bit of a conversation prior to obviously going out and you've really set yourself a tough challenge. Do you want to tell the listeners that you're not just getting into hunting, you've like you've gone all out here to <laughs> make it hard for yourself. I've set myself up for failure. That's what you're saying. Hey? <laughs> failure and frustration. Well, I don't say failure because I I just, every time I go out, I learn something new or have such a great time. Like that day we went out, I had such a blast. So even though we didn't get an animal on the deck, that still is a success for me anyway. So, mm. and that's where I guess I like your attitude. So I'll let you tell what you're doing and then I'll explain why I really like that attitude. All right. Look, so just to clarify, I do have my R license. I don't have my gun license yet but um sorry that's correct i um i've been thinking about starting to hunt for a very long time now um a couple of years the main motivation is uh just thoughts about eating animals how to be ethical about that and um i guess my progression like in moving away from factory farm meat to more ethically raised farmed animals sort of like a natural progression to investigate hunting and I mean, it's part of the way that I'm going about this is, uh, I guess it's theoretical or philosophical in nature, but also because of practical restraints or maybe trying to be pragmatic. But um, I sort of set myself the goal of starting with bow hunting rather than with a rifle and also a traditional bow rather than a compound bow. I think I've got a bit of maybe like a romantic idea about how hunting works. And whenever I mention it to anyone who knows anything about hunting, they always sort of just shake their head and they look at me like, this guy has absolutely no idea what he's got himself in for. But I think I've got a slight idea. You know, I know it's I know hunting's hard just in general. I know bow hunting's harder and I know trad bow hunting's even more difficult. Um, but, you know, I think I'm slowly evolving. Gun license is on the near horizon, especially after speaking with you. And then not hopefully not far down the track will be a rifle um and i guess i just want to experience it all but the idea of you know putting in the work going out there learning how to shoot a traditional bow and then having to stalk an animal that much to be, to get that much closer to it is just i guess i sort of see it like the payoff is going to be that much greater for me even if it takes me twice as many years to get there just that sense of satisfaction to actually work work really hard for something something that appeals to me yeah i don't know if that answered your question specifically but it did because 
what I was getting at is I, I don't know if you remember, but one of the things you said to me was that you don't care if it takes you 10 years to get a deer. Yeah. You want to pursue the traditional bow and that's the way you want to do it. And I've got a lot of respect for that because for me, I've always been about the journey and the challenge. And yeah. that's, you know, it's one that I feel is so important. Everyone has a different journey and whatnot. And yours struck me as something that, that the reason I wanted to get you on here is A, we went out together, but B, is that goal and that you know you've set yourself up for this really long, difficult path, but you're super happy and excited about it. And that, I guess that enthusiasm resonated with me and I got super excited as well going, oh, this guy's, you know, he's at the beginning of his journey and it sort of reinvigorated me a little bit because there are times I sit there and go, hey, I'm, you know, I got this podcast going on and it's doing quite well and I haven't got a deer yet. And I, I feel like a bit of a, uh, what's that imposter syndrome sort of thing oh, yeah. but uh, for me it's the journey and I'm I saw that in you as well and that's I think why we got on so well on the day and we had some really good chats but mate let's get into it so I know your friends were a little concerned about how <laughs> where we were going and, and meeting up with an absolute stranger and I, I think that's thanks to you know Mr. Malat but yeah they um, they did they thought I was a bit crazy uh, who's this guy you're going with and I sort of said to them you know I I have no idea I said don't worry he's got a bow he doesn't have a rifle so at least I can do a runner and hopefully I'll be all right but yeah so um what woke up 3 a.m bright and early on a Monday morning took the drive down south and um yeah, met you in the dark, hey? We wanted to get a good start. Yeah, we got down there early. Oh, did you see some of the looks we were getting? So we met up at the uh, at the VC sort of, you know, truck stop. Rest stop, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the rest stop there. And uh, I rocked up in all camo, ready to go. <laughs> Jeez, there was some uh, looks cast our way, but that's okay. Yeah, there were some people camping there. You know, when I was waiting for you, there were bunnies all around the place and – the weekend before I went to a property down south trying to find some rabbits, two days walking around this farm, I saw two rabbits and I was sitting there, you know, on the side of the road, truck zooming by and I saw about 10 of them hopping around the dunnies. So I had a bit of a chuckle to myself. Um, but yeah, it was uh, an interesting start to the morning. Well, mate, there's a plethora of animals there because uh, I'm jumping way ahead here as I was leaving. One of the private properties there had emus amongst the cows. I'm oh, looking yeah, over right. and I'm... Sort of like, what the hell's that? And I'm, I'm, I was so, so taken aback because, like, we're just in Belanglo. <laughs> then this, yeah, it was really weird. And I'd saw a, a lone kangaroo in the other paddock just jumping along on its own in the middle of nowhere. And I was like, this is some things I've never seen before. Mm. And uh, yeah, those emus just in the middle of the cows, just strutting around with them. It was very unique. Yeah, so we wanted to get down there early and jump in just more because we hadn't been to the forest before. And sorry, you did say you have your R license. I remember that. We couldn't get you booked in because there's only two hunters allowed in the forest at any one time. So I obviously had my permit, but you were coming along just as sort of an observer. And we uh, basically I did some scouting beforehand, picked a couple of areas that I thought would be good and – we went to check them out. Now, as always in a state forest, we came across a gate that said, hey, private property, no good. Um, there's no map. Well, there's nothing on the maps to say, hey, you can't go through here. But we didn't want to chance it. So I was like, well, this is pretty close to where I wanted to be anyway. Let's just go for a walk. And uh, I hooked you up with some of my Ridgeline gear, and gave you some Blaze Orange and whatnot. Um, and then we got straight into it. How'd that go? It was good. And you know what? I wasn't expecting it to be that chilly. I was not prepared for it to be that cold. And lucky you did give me that because that fleece was toasty warm. And um, I guess I wasn't as much of a bumbling fool standing out like a sore thumb when I did have a bit of camo on. So that's probably a good move on your part. But yeah, we took that walk. Hey, and 10, 20 meters in, footprints. I just remember you pointing down saying, hey, check this out. And I... You know, that's the first thing that I took away and that I was that I told everyone when I came back is I was walking along being very cautious to be as quiet as I can, looking down for sticks and bark and leaves. And as soon as you pointed out that track, it was like the faintest little impression there in the sand. It just sort of clicked in my head like, oh, yes, that's something else that I need to be aware of. So now not only was I looking down to minimize the noise that I was making, but I was looking down for sign as well, which is 
you know, something that I had, I think on the way down there, you asked me, you had that phone chat in the car on when we were driving down and you said, um, oh, you know, you can have a look at my range finder and play with that. And he said, look, I don't want to be disrespectful or anything, but what do you know? Like how much info do you have about how everything works? And I think I said to you something like, look, I've watched a lot of stuff, read a lot of things. So I've got a lot of theory, but no practical experience. So yeah, I know what a range finder is, but I've never used one. I know that there are sign, footprints, scat, rubbings, but not until you actually pointed it out, did I sort of consciously register, oh yeah, that's right. That's something that you know I have seen, but if you didn't point it out, I never would have looked for it. It's not always like that. I will tell you now in a state forest, it was uh, very lucky and we saw a lot that day. There was a lot of sign out and about in the areas that we went to. So that's good. And essentially what we wanted to do is we wanted to sort of go around nice and high, just on those sunny slopes and, and glass along because uh, Belanglo is quite elevated. There's a lot of elevation that you've got to get up to. And there's also a lot of parts that are, I guess, open or it's either really open or it's really thick that's what i noticed about it and we found some really good spots in that first little section that we went to and a nice little gully that we uh were able to sort of sit there and that was cool getting to sit there and watch that lyre bird Mm. doing its thing and doing a bit of a scrape and sort of being able to talk about that and the different noises and and how they were moving so that was fun but yeah we saw a fair bit and we were able to sort of track a, a few different prints along some trails so we knew which way they were sort of moving and then we ended up um yeah we did find the rub in that first section didn't we yeah a couple of broken branches and a bit of a rub there yeah and we saw that wallaby legging it down the hill like it was when we were sitting there glassing it was quite nice and yeah, as you said to just be able to follow those tracks completely unexpected i was prepared to go there and see absolutely nothing and to just spot that first set of prints that just made my day and it just got better. I felt really bad because, geez, it took us about four hours before I found any deer sign for you, some scat. And I was, you know, we saw a lot of prints and we saw quite a few rubs and I was showing and pointing those out to you. And I was actually a bit perplexed because I'm sitting here going, seems like a really good area. There's a lot of movement here. There is literally no sign or like, sorry, there's no scat uh, there's literally no scat here. What the hell? Um, so we spent a couple of hours in there. That was quite a, a good little session. Had some glassing and, and whatnot and then came back to the car. It was great taking you out in a sense because I've forgotten a little bit of what it was like when I went out and I saw my first deer print and I found my first rub and it sort of took me back when I saw you grab the camera out. And I think I was actually asking you at this time when – do you want to take a photo? Because I know we've been talking about it and you, you were telling me about your son and wanting him to show these things. So that that took me back and I've I, I got to thank you for that because I forgot I did that and how excited I used to get over finding something like that. And then I was like, oh, yeah, like it is cool to think about, you know, like that that's cool that we can go out into the bush and find oh, there's some deer prints and sort of track them along and find more and more and more and then find the rub and, and things like that. That was, that's, you know, really fun. What did your son think? Did You know, like you took a few of the, the shots of the different prints and things like that. What did he think? You know, honestly, he, was, he wasn't excited as I was. I mean, he was interested, but, you know, I showed him, I was like, look at this, buddy, you know, there's deer prints here and this, this bit of the tree here was, was rubbed a while ago. And he's like, oh, that's cool. Did you see any deer? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> no, mate, we didn't see any, but this is almost as good. So he doesn't quite get it. But yeah, I was chuffed. And I remember, yeah, when we saw the scat, I was like, hand in my pocket, ready to get my phone out, thinking, oh, that's going to think I'm an absolute weirdo. I want to take a photo of this dear shit. But then I remember you saying, like, do you want to take a photo of this too? And I was like, yes, I do, <laughs> definitely. Because that's it. You know, I, I see pictures online about prints and scat and. You just don't get that perspective. Like when you're there in person, you can really take it in about it. Just you can really get a good idea of what it actually looks at. Like if it was just an image that I'd seen online and I had to compare two different things. Like we saw some pig tracks too, I remember, and you were explaining how a little bit different, just those things. It makes a huge difference. So yeah, I sent the pictures of the prints to my mates and they're not hunters and they're not interested at all. So 
but it's it's like that. You got that new child kind of thing, you know. You want to show it off, and yeah, as far as I'm concerned, that was a success. Seeing that for me, uh, you know, three out of three, you know, all in the one day. The the rub, the scat, and the prints was awesome. As you said, the only thing we didn't see was deer. And uh, look, I do think that it was a really windy day, so our scent was getting blown around everywhere, and we were talking about that when we were moving through and stopping, going, "Oh, it's just come from behind us. Can you feel it?" And it's now pushing it to where we're moving and it's, it was just swirling. So it wasn't a great day for bow hunting, especially because it was just pushing through. But I did feel the deer were either going to be like bedding down a lot, trying to get out of that wind and geez, it's thick there. So, you know, they could be anywhere. So that was, look, I, I had a really good time for that. The second spot we went to, I found that there was just so much more sign. I thought the first, the first spot was great. Second spot, was even better and that was where we got to see the scat and that was also where we found some really good rubs and it was clear that there was i think we actually sorry it was also a couple of prints that were fresh fresh and they had water still in them because they sort of went down so deep but there was no water hadn't rained or anything so it was they were nice and fresh which was really exciting yeah that second spot was it had like a whole different vibe to it. I remember like the first spot, very crunchy underfoot, really dry. And that second spot, yeah, as you say, muddy with those prints. And I remember after a while, you sort of said to me, look, there's a lot of sign here. We need to start going slow now. And we started creeping along and that was fun. Like just that feeling of anticipation. I mean, before that, when we would stopped at a few places and we'd have a bit of a glass over this, um, like on a rock there, I'd spot something moving or I'd hear sound and because there's a potential that it could be a deer, I instantly just go straight there in my mind. And I remember saying to you, oh, I saw something move or I heard something over there. And you would sort of like humor me a little bit and like have a bit of a look and say, I think it's a lyre bird or I think it's a wallaby kind of thing. I could hear it scratching. But when we started to move slowly and when you said, okay, now we need to sort of be a bit more careful, that's just when the fun sort of like ramped up for me. Being so mindful of moving through there and feeling like such a klutz every now and then, I'd like be trying to tiptoe and lose my balance and grab onto a tree kind of thing and make a ruckus. But yeah, just that feeling of mindfully and like purposefully moving along and being so aware of where you're going. It's, I, I never moved through the bush like that in my life, you know? It was something totally new. So we talk about the stages of sort of skill development or or learning and there's like cognitive which is real beginner that you need to be thinking about everything you do and you need sort of feedback then you move into sort of associative where you can put multiple steps together you know what you're doing but it's not just comes naturally you still have to think about i need to do this and then we move to autonomous where you're just doing these things and for me, that was really interesting and I thoroughly enjoyed our time together because when I was explaining things, it really assisted me in thinking about them and going, oh, I, I don't think about some of these things anymore. I just sort of do it. And, I, and for me, that's a big one, being able to sort of articulate that to you and say, hey, we're doing this and why. And it also sort of made me think about the game plan a bit more Sometimes I can get, I'll put my hand up, I get too excited and I just go, oh, I'm going to do this or this. Or, you know, you can always second guess. You sit there and go, do we go? How many times did we come up to a trail and there was three or four heads going different ways going, hmm, which way do I go? And you've got to pick one and go it. And sometimes I really struggle with making that decision or sticking to it. But when I was, I found when I was talking to yourself about that, it made it a bit clearer. So it's something I think I took away from it going, hey, there's a strategy I'm going to do is I'm going to talk myself through what the scenario is, what the steps are before I make the decision rather than just go, oh, that was the decision I made because I said I need to get to this spot on the map or there's a lot of sign here, I'm going that way. I think I need to break it down. And I think we were lucky in the sense is we were both going down there. I said this to her before we get down there. We're not. I don't think we're going to get anything for me, A, we're going out with a bow. I haven't even got to deal with a rifle in a state forest. So that's a, a limited session. But more just a recon, find some good spots and 
see what's about there because I'd never been to the forest either. So for me, I, I had an absolute blast of a time, found a lot of stuff. And then that was really interesting being able to talk to you and say, hey, these are why we're going to do what we're going to do. And this is the reason behind it. Now, hey, could be wrong. I don't know because we didn't get a deer. But from my understanding, my knowledge, the things I've learned over this journey, I, I thought we were on the right track. So, yeah, that was pretty exciting. And then also been able to bounce off and talk about why I was going to do something. That also helped me, I found. Well, it's like that reminds me, you know, it makes me think of my son, you know, when he asked me a question about language in particular, you know, why, what does this word mean? I know what it means. I know how to use the word. I know what somebody means when they use the word. When, But to give him a definition for some things, it's almost completely beyond me. This is, I don't know where it comes from. I was saying like, you don't truly understand something unless you can explain it to someone else. And I find a lot of the time when he asks me questions, things I think I know, but I don't really understand them because I can't explain it to him. Uh, it's just kind of like... Um, like being able to comprehend things in context, but outside of that context, the actual definition or the actual meaning of the thing, I have no idea what it is. And being and having to explain it to him really highlights that for me. It just sort of sounds like a similar thing. As you say, when you talk through it, even if it's just to your, you're explaining it to yourself, you can test whether you whether you really understand it. I mean, one of my first jobs was working in a like an electronics store and I had no electronics background and a customer would come in and ask me a question and just finding the answer to the question for them helped me understand it. And that's where I learned everything, just trying to answer questions that I didn't have the answer to. Yeah, I think one of the hardest things to do, you might have a great deal of knowledge, but being able to get it across to someone and teach someone else is one of the really difficult things to do. And that's one thing that, you know, obviously it helps with my background, but being able to understand, and, and you're similar to what I am in the sense that you've got the theoretical because I study and have watched pretty much everything and read every book you can pretty much get your hand on. And then it was for me getting out there on my own and just doing the hard yards and finding those prints and, and getting, you know, what does a rub look like? What does a scrape look like? And finding them, working out what they are, why they are, are they wrong, and, and bouncing ideas off other people, taking photos, because I've done that, take take photos if I'm unsure and send them to people that are far more advanced than me and saying, hey, what are your thoughts on this? And it's interesting because there's been a lot of times where I've done that and I've sent it to three or four different people who I have a lot of respect for who I know are really good hunters, and I've got three or four different answers. So sometimes I sort of sit there and go, okay, well, unless you've got a, tra a trail cam on there, you're not 100% sure what it is as well. Now, obviously, you know, within reason, footprints, a lot of the time you can tell 100%. Uh, most times rubs, you can be pretty confident. But there are times where people get, you know, believe they're different things or, or the like. What were some of the takeaways from the day for you? There were a lot of like really little things that when you look back on it, when I look back on it, I kind of think, yeah, look, that's obvious. But... Like I said, you know, until it's pointed out to you, you're not conscious of it. I remember at one stage, and like it actually, sometimes it actually made me feel extremely stupid. You know, there would be a, a broken branch, and it looked from where I was standing to be fresh. And I'd say to you, like, oh, do you think that's fresh? And all you did was touch it. Go, no, that's pretty dry. You know, it's something that's just so simple to do that I guess maybe it's the excitement about it as well you know like i see something that looks green it's a fresh break and instantly i want it to be fresh maybe that's why but also like a, a footprint in the mud we saw and it had water in it and i said do you, do you think it's fresh and i recall you saying something like look if the water inside is muddied if it's like um murky and uh like disturbed then it's more likely to be fresh if the water's clear it's going to be a bit older and i mean that's pretty basic stuff in terms of the world you know in terms of just how things function but when you're in that situation i just found that there were things that i would hope that i would just be able to they would just be like common sense but you, i don't know what what it is i think it is that adrenaline or that excitement you just maybe want it to be fresh or you don't even think about it i just see a print 
not used to seeing prints. It's in soft mud. To me, that's like a go. Um, so it's just those little things that I guess, as you say, with experience, you just become more used to it. It becomes less um, less conscious thought or cognition involved in trying to understand what's going on and more just like an autonomous and natural reaction to things. Like um, first spot we stopped to glass where we saw the lyrebird, I subconsciously noticed the wind started blowing differently. The leaves in the trees were moving and I could hear the rustling. And you said, oh, did you feel that? Wind changed. And I knew that something had happened, but I didn't know that the wind had changed and it was now on our backs until you said it. And then again, it was another thing. I thought, okay, I've got to be more aware of this. And that's the thing, or one of the things that really appealed to me about hunting is being more aware of what's going on around you, just to have to be more conscious and to like just slow down a bit. So I think that's the main thing that I got, just all those little things that I was missing. I I love it because it, it's, it's a mad challenge. Like it's so great in that sense, but it's all these little things that you keep putting together and learning and adding up and, as I've said, I'm no expert and I've, I, you know, I'm far from, I've got a long way to go on my journey, but I just love the fact that I have learned so much since I started. And sometimes I forget that. And sometimes I forget where I'm at. It's a hard one to measure your success by because there are people that measure your success by how big the antlers are. There are people that measure success by how many you've knocked over. People that measure success by just getting out there and having fun. For me, I feel connected. And that to me is exciting and being in tune with nature in being able to sense that oh, the wind changed and not even, you know, I didn't need my little windicator. I could tell you I, I felt it and went, oh, I'll check with the windicator, but I'd already felt it and gone, all right, our sense now blowing down this way. That's not great. Now, you know, we need to do this and, and rehash. And I think that's part of the journey. Like for me, that's being – in tune with nature is so important and that's a massive win for me and the more I feel like that and the more I feel at home and comfortable out in the bush that's what I want to achieve and the rest will come I'm hoping I could be wrong here but I do feel that once you have that sense that you're in tune and you can hear what's going on and just have that understanding it's really putting you on the right direction. And I thoroughly enjoyed being able to talk about that because if you weren't there, I probably wouldn't have even thought about it. Oh, oh wind's changed and just move on. Whereas explaining to you, oh, the wind's changed, we need to now think about this. It was just, I found it was really helpful for me in you know, unpacking my own theories and thoughts. And you know, we left and I called a friend of mine and we spoke about it and I talked about all those different things and why I didn't think they were moving and bounced ideas because they're much more experienced than I am as a hunter. And I think that's, that's for me, that's one of the reasons I started the podcast. Oh, the start of the first podcast and then onto this one was I wanted to talk to guests who were knowledgeable or had good stories or their experiences because everyone's got something to offer. And that conversation is how I want to learn. I want to hear from different people whether, hey, that's a good idea, that's a bad idea, um, doesn't mean that I have to apply everything that I talk to and learn because that's going to be near impossible, but just getting little snippets and taking things away. And, and even like, you know, before we did the podcast, he said, oh, are you sure you want me on here? And I was like, yeah, 100%. You've got something to offer. I want to hear from your eyes what happened. And you gave me a lot of value in being able to just say, hey, this is why I'm going to do something like this to make me – proactively think about what I'm doing and explain why I'm doing it. And sometimes I feel I get a, a bit ahead of myself and I just do something. So, you know, I, I definitely thank you for um, for that on the day. That was a really good thing. Oh, mate, I'm glad to hear that you got something out of it. That's good because, yeah, I got a lot out of it, a lot. You know, and as you say, that, that connection to nature is, I know it maybe sounds like a little bit cliche, but and like as I get older, you know, when I'm going camping with my little boy, he's seven years old, he's in the back. If it's a long drive, he's on his Nintendo or something. And I have a rule when we're on the boring roads, he can look at his screen. But as soon as we hit the dirt, screens go off and we're looking at nature. And if there's a view over a valley or a beautiful sunset or something, I get excited. I'm like, hey, dude, look out the window. Look at that there. 
he just glances up and he's like, okay, cool, back to his Nintendo. And I remember when I was a kid, I didn't care about sunsets or valleys. I don't know what it is when you get older, and I don't think it applies to everyone, but I just feel that, yeah, that like awe of nature and to be able to just understand these tiny little pieces. Like we're walking along that one game trail, and I told you when we got to the end there, I said, I was following Wombat because there was fresh scat dropped every now and then. And I would just see it. It was like a little friend, you know, like I'd be walking along and there was more and there was more. And just that little thing of being, going through the bush in a place where I normally wouldn't and to be aware of like looking down at the ground, not just where I was stepping, but the possible sign, that was fun. And it was like the most minute little thing. We're not after wombats, but just to be aware of what's happening and to know the difference between different animal poo is exciting as as an old man now. So I totally get that. When we saw the live bird, that was cool because he was playing around, he was making some awesome noises and he was pretty active over on that hill that we were glassing. Had cheesy sounded loud. Like he tricked us a few times by moving off and I was like, geez, that sounds a bit bigger than him and it was definitely him. But um, it takes me back where, and we're talking about success and I still remember one of my favourite moments of being out hunting was I was sitting there glassing and I had an echidna just walk up, walk through my legs and basically under my knee as it went out. And I just went, wow. That experience of just being blended in to the surrounds that he had no idea I was there. He just sort of came up, did he? He was on his merry little way. But for me, that was such a big one. And I was I, – I, I, you know, that, geez, that was probably about eight years ago, I reckon. From, sorry, no, it was probably about five years ago, I reckon. And that still just resonates with me and it's as clear as day. And that's what I think going out and just resetting and being amongst nature does. It's such a great thing. And I never feel as happy. I know I was driving home and I was just like, geez, geez, it was good. And, you know, I always feel re-energized by getting out into the bush. And even if it's not successful, it doesn't have to be. It's just getting out there, finding new places, exploring. We found some cool sites. I was sort of expecting to see some sort of like rock art or something like that because there were some really great spots that we found. And that was the other one, how some of the spots, has anyone ever been there before? And that romanticism about that is sensational and it's something that I really, really enjoy. And I think hunters get that. I think it doesn't matter what stage in your hunting career you're at, is that you thoroughly enjoy that journey or that, I guess, wherever you are and what you're seeing and just that captures you in that moment, which is a fantastic thing. That's magic about the echidna. Yeah, like that. You're so Whenever I go to the bush, I'm not sitting still. I'm camping. I'm forward driving. Um, but, yeah, you, you, when you do sit still, it just goes on around you. I mean, I haven't had a kidna walk between my legs, but, you know, just sitting by a river trying to decide whether there may be fish in there for 10 minutes and then popping up and there's a ruse a couple of meters behind you who had no idea that you were there. That stuff doesn't happen if you're just, if you're not hunting or you're not scouting an area. It just is totally different. And I think you're right. That's, that's half the appeal just being out there in a different context and experiencing it a different way. So you said you learn a few different things. What would be some takeaways, whether it be gear, whether it be what to look for? Was there a couple of things that stood out for you? Yeah, look, one one thing that really stood out was our discussion about um, hunting advantage. I mean, we were sitting on the first spot. We stopped to glass where we saw the wallaby and the lyre bird and we were chatting about how some people think hunters have an unfair advantage over the animals because it was so thick there. And I remember you said to me, like, look, even if you've got a rifle here, it's not just shooting fish in a barrel. To see a deer is hard enough. But if you're lucky to see that, to get a clean shot with a rifle is tough. And I was, until you're there in the hunting context, I mean, I've been in thick bush before, but I'm not trying to think, oh, if there was a deer 10 metres away, could I shoot it? That would have been hard in that situation. And I really, part of the reason I've been so attracted to bow hunting is I want to make it, like I said, as difficult as it can be for my own reward, just to have to work for something tough. 
but also because I feel more uh, I feel more okay with it if the playing field is leveled as much as it can be. And I, being naive, I just thought bow's going to be the hardest thing, rifle's too easy. Um, but yeah, it's really not. And I've got no qualms about using a rifle, not because I think it's equal, uh, like in terms of advantage with the animal, um, but yeah, it's definitely a lot more difficult than I thought, even with a rifle. Um, I can't remember if it was on your podcast or someone else. I don't remember who it was, but they were discussing how you know, even just having the ability to drive to a state forest in an automobile is an unfair advantage over the animals. You know, we can't eliminate the advantage, but um, that really stuck out at me and was definitely a motivator to to sort of work towards a gun license and a rifle someday. Yeah. Yeah, it's a that's a tricky one. I I always hear people say, "Oh, you've got a high-powered rifle." What if they had a high-powered rifle? And it's a, it's a very naive comment and they haven't been out there and they haven't seen and and they do have this picture in their mind of these maybe rolling flats or so rolling grass hills and you know, you can see for kilometers and then yeah, okay, you can sort of say, "Well, you know, potentially that the animal doesn't even know you're there. And if you say long distance shooting of, you know, 500 meters plus, not something that I do, but hey, you know, that may be, you know, there's a lot of challenge in actually doing the shot, but the animal doesn't know you're there. But when you're stalking or in a state forest and yeah, we, we had some spots there. I reckon we didn't even have three meters visibility. And I think after coming out of one of those patches was where I said, man, like even if there's a deer there or you see or you bump it, you're not shooting at it because you cannot clearly identify that target. You have no idea what's behind it. You're sort of just moving through it, hoping that it's going to get a bit more open or a bit nicer to, to be able to spot something. But yeah, it's a really interesting one when people start to unpack that. And and again, I, you know, when probably before I was into hunting and shooting, which is when I was a teenager, I did probably sit there and go, Hey, it was a little unfair, but you know, my mind has definitely, definitely change i think after the first couple of times you go out you start to sit there and go hmm this maybe not be this might not be as easy as i thought and the animals are so much more switched on and they're so they've got so many senses that just their heightened senses really put you at a disadvantage and i don't know if you noticed but as you, you mentioned it slightly before the amount of noise you make when you're walking through the bush even slipping and grabbing something and cracking. And there was a couple of times when we were going slow and I was actually really happy. I think that's probably the best and quietest I've been when I've been walking. And there's still times you're going to snap a branch or snap a twig. And, you know, you just sort of got to stop and wait and, you know, hopefully nothing has hurt or spooked or, and I noticed that I found with the bow, I was so much more patient and slow compared to I am with a rifle. I really enjoyed that side of it. I felt that it was making me go a lot slower because I had in this mind that I can't get as, I have to get a lot closer because I've got the bow. So I need to be far better at stalking. So maybe that's something that I need to address and it's something that I learned from it as well, being able to think about this gun. Hmm, maybe I'm moving too quick. I don't think I am, but maybe I am. And then with the bow, I was like, geez, I'm moving a lot slower. And I think that just sort of naturally happened because I was thinking about the fact that I had to get closer and I didn't have the rifle. And that made a big difference in me and stalking on the day as well. So as I said, every time you go out, you learn something new, or you apply a different skill or you get that little bit better and that's life. That's what we should all be doing. If you, if you're sort of there hunting and you uh, have done it all or you're not learning, what's the point? You know, it's a challenge. That's the whole idea of it. And that's why I got into hunting because, you know, as I get older, I've noticed that, you know, you, you can't play the sports that you once could. And I don't want to, I want to have something that I can do for the rest of my life. And I feel hunting is that, hopefully. So, yeah, it's good fun. What about gear? Was there any gear you sort of went, hmm, that's probably, that's really handy? Yeah, look, it's been on my list to get a bino harness and very generous of you to lend me one of yours. It made a huge difference. I mean, 
like just being out on a property the weekend before binos in hand with like the strap around my neck and trying to carry a bow as well it was difficult to have that easy like magnet flap opening right there if i need an extra hand i can just pop it in huge difference so yeah bino harness and i think i mentioned to you gators top of my list and boots you know i was in my work boots no, we didn't walk too far, so it wasn't that bad. But I think maybe if I had better boots, I wouldn't be as loud underfoot. But um, I can see doing some Ks, it's going to sort of start wearing. So that's that's sort of like at the top of my list. That made a huge difference at Bino Harness. And then I guess as I get as I'm going out more with a bow, actually booking a hunt, then I'm going to have to start thinking more about the actual. Uh, bow that I'm using and the the arrows and the uh, tips and things um, and then maybe and, and when I get to a rifle I guess that's just going to open up a whole other can of worms of stuff that I need but yeah those are the things that really stood out to me do you find you enjoy the research side of things so when you you just said oh I'm thinking you know eventually I'll get a rifle it's sort of almost like this new wormhole that you can go down. What calibers? There's so many calibers. Oh, what's a grain of a bullet mean? Like there's so many yeah. different elements that you can sort of explore. Well, when it comes to calibers and stuff, I still, it just like my head's swimming when I start to look into it. But I remember you mentioned to me, that if you want to get a rifle, look at a Ticket T3X, was it? I think you said yeah, that's it. a great gun. That's one, of my, that's one of my favorites. And if you look at my YouTube history, Matt, it's just video after video reviews like how to clean it and, and so i feel you there like i like to get into the research um i've got this i'm frugal when it comes to spending but i also don't want to buy junk you know i want to buy something that's going to get the job done i don't want it to be fancy i want it to work and last and you know and everything i looked at for those ticket rifles everyone's just talking about how smooth this bolt is and like when they're reviewing the rifle People are just sliding it in and out, talking about how amazing it is for the price range. And as soon as I saw that, I thought, okay, no, Matt's recommended a great rifle and that's on my list. And then binos and things like that, that gets complicated as well. Different types of glass, lenses and uh, glass. And the, so, you know, I do get caught in wormholes and I just sort of get lost. And but at the end of the day, I think it was uh, Profty was on your other podcast. He was saying like, don't wait until you have all the gear, just get out there. And that sort of was my mentality by whatever binos I can afford for now, just get out there in my work boots and just cover some ground. Um, and just as I go, tick things off my list. Yeah. And that was one of the things I liked at also coming out and bringing you some gear and saying, Hey, test this out. Try this. This is, Something, you know, I, I feel, as I said, from, I've always said it, I'm not an expert, but I feel I'm going to do it again. I've already teed up another um, trip with a, a new hunter that I'm getting involved in into it. And I think it does make you feel like you're giving back. And even though I might not be that experienced and there's a lot more that you need to learn than that I need to learn, it's at least a starting point. And if we can go out and have a good day, and I had a thoroughly – enjoyable time that is a win and you're more likely to keep doing it which is a win for me as well and i got on really well with you we'll keep in touch and and whatnot that's a win as well because it's just that expanding that network of people that we if you're going out for a hunt i'd hope you'd give me a yell and say hey i'm going to that state forest again you want to come and vice versa and i think that's the win out of the whole thing and yeah profity said just get out there that's such good advice i was probably the opposite and I wanted all the gear and I wanted to have that before getting out there. And it probably held me back a little bit. I should have probably just done that. So, yeah, no, it was good to good to get out there, good to hear your side of it and where how you saw it and what you're looking at now and what you need to get. And no, it's good. I'm really glad you enjoyed yourself and you're going to be out there and you've just opened up a book now. You're going to just – it just absorbs you. Wait till you see a deer. Wait till you actually see one and then – you know, or you get a chance to get close to one or, or potentially shoot one and it just plays on your mind. What did I do wrong? What happened here? And it's just, mate, it's, you get the bug. Well, you know, I'm a bit stubborn maybe in some ways. A lot of things I say to myself, I'm just going to figure it out on my own. Like 
whether it's a hobby I'm interested in or I want to make something or build something, I'll just figure it out. And sometimes I'm a bit hesitant to reach out to people and ask for help or to see if they'll teach me things. And, you know, so in the past, I've just thought, no, I'm going to go out in the bush by myself and I'll figure out how to hunt. But, you know, when you hear about some of the best people in whatever area they're working in or whatever sport they're doing, they've, they haven't done it on their own. They've, they have sought out help. They've had some sort of mentor or some sort of guidance. And just going out with you on that one day, now when I go out to a state forest on my own, I won't be an idiot. I will at least have an idea of where I'm going wrong. Not necessarily what I need to do right, but you know, when I'm walking along, if I was by myself, I wouldn't have, if there was tracks, I wouldn't have seen them because I wouldn't have been looking for them. Only when I got home would I have thought, hey, wait a minute, you know, I should have been looking for sign. So yeah, just a day does make me feel so much more confident to get out there and just explore, not hunt really, you know, just to just get accustomed to being out there and thinking that way, being conscious of those things. So yeah, thanks for that, mate. Huge difference it will make. And yeah, 100%. No, no worries. And I think one of the other things just before we wrap up is talking about safety. I know before we went out, we spoke about safety and I told you where my PLB was and first aid and everything there. So we had a clear understanding if, if something went wrong and that can be tricky when you go out on your own having your gps and navigating and getting turned around and that happens it's it's one of those things so i think that was probably one i regret out of all my things is when i first got out there uh, i got turned around a couple of times and like in the first two hunts i got turned around a couple of times and lucky enough we're pretty lucky in state forests if you walk in a certain direction you're probably going to hit a road at some stage a logging road so it can get quite off-putting too and it's it's one thing that i think that's a if i had to do it all over again and start from scratch i'm very stubborn i like to do things on my own as well and that's how i've done it so far pretty much um for me that's one that i'd probably sit there and go hey the, the gps and the navigating and things like that is something that I'd like to be shown and have down a bit more. And I had a bit of background from my previous military service and whatnot, but, you know, you can always have more and it had been a long time since uh, since that. So, mate, um, I've loved that you uh, had such a great time and you gave me a lot on the day too and, and being the first person I've taken out. So that was, um, mate, I really appreciate your, your company and, and coming along for the ride and, and coming on tonight to talk about it too. That's um you know, it's a big thing, can be a bit off-putting to, to put yourself out there when you're not an expert and you don't know as much as a lot of other people. But, uh, hey, we're all learning and I've learned over my life, not in hunting but in other th- areas, I've learned a lot of things from people with a lot less experience than me. So sometimes it works well. Thanks, mate. I really appreciate it, mate. Really do. And uh, thanks for having me here on the podcast. No worries, mate. So, um, all right, listeners, hope you got something out of it. And uh, I know it was very different experience for me and I thoroughly enjoyed it and I would be imploring all of you is no matter what your skill level or whatnot get someone else out there into the bush it's only going to do wonders for our sport all right guys take it easy and bye for now if you have a topic guest question or any gear that you want to hear about on the podcast shoot us an email australian hunting and beyond at gmail.com alternatively find us on facebook instagram and twitter All the links are in the show notes. If you haven't already, make sure you give us a review and subscribe to our podcast on whatever platform you're listening on. Thanks for joining us and we'll catch you next time.